Um, yeah, so our next distinguished um, speaker is Dr. Natasha Paul. Uh, she is a multidisciplinary academic, novelist, poet, artist, and economist. She's currently an associate professor in politics and international relations at the Center of the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster in London. She has previously worked as an assistant professor in economics at the Bristol Business School and as an associate professor in creative writing in Bhutan. Over the last two decades, she has researched and published extensively on themes related to democracy, political e economy, identity, the rise of right-wing nationalism, feminist and post-colonial critiques related to Bhutan, India, and Kashmir. She speaks within and outside academia. Her books include Imagining Economics Otherwise, Future Tense, Pan-Asian Literary Prize uh, shortlisted novel Residue, and Can You Hear Kashmiri Women Speak? which she co-edited. Her works also include Misogyny and Authoritarians in Contemporary Democracies, Post-Colonial Neoliberal Nationalism, Hindutva in India and Beyond, Rising India, Fallen Freedoms, Islamophobia, Democracy, Dissent in India, uh, China, Xinjiang, India, Kashmir, Coloniality and Eco-Nationalism in Kashmir, Feminist Analysis of India, Indian Obsession with Kashmir. Her topic for today's talk is Democracy Under Threat in India and Beyond. Natasha, the mic is all yours. Thank you. So uh, thank you, everyone. And thank you for the, for the introduction. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really something, do, you know, doing these talks is not something we, we want to be doing. We'd much rather be talking of other things. And it's, uh, but it's just so important that more and more people are aware of what's going on in India and not just in India, uh, more and more the global links become relevant. And I think it's, it's important to perceive those. So, uh, so uh, you know, following on from what Vibesh just has been talking about, which is, uh, and, I, and I want to sort of pick up on two, two specific things before I go into my own talk. One, this idea that the most extreme and egregious instances of things happening are a fringe phenomenon is, is very much the way in which the, the, you know, the slippery slope into ever greater violence is enabled. So I remember that in December 2015, there was this program called Head to Head hosted by Mehdi. Okay, now it's gone back. So uh, in, that, in that program, the head of the RSS, uh, Ram Madhav was there. And, uh, you know, and I, and I uh, was one of the people that was one of the expert interlocutors there. And I asked various things about the growing volume of violence in India and drawing it on attention to the increasing killings and lynchings of minorities and specifically also pointed out, as I have done in my other work, that the, chief, the, the you know, a BJP member of parliament had shared the stage with activists, extremist Hindutva activists, who had called for the, uh, you know, for the graves of dead Muslim women to be exhumed and for their corpses to be raped. And and every, you know, this, this, and, and this is just, I mean, there was a whole lot. So all of my work is, is online and easily available. But, but in response to that, a lot of people said, well, you know, this is just a fringe phenomenon. This is just one guy. He's just one crazy person who, you know, there's, there's always these people. Uh, and now, fast forward a couple more years, that person then ended up and still is the, the chief minister of the most populous state in the country. His name is, uh, you know, the name he goes by is uh, Yogi Adityanath. So, so the things that are at one point seen as fringe phenomenon and rebutted as fringe phenomena are not really fringe phenomenon. So, so in the run up to the 2019 elections, there were uh, BJP members of parliament that ended up saying things like, well, we don't, you know, if we win the next time, we don't really need elections anymore. Now, today, somebody pointing that out may be told that that's a fringe phenomena. But can we be sure that five years down the line, democracy is not going to be fundamentally attacked in ways that that are then uh, impossible to recover from? So that's one thing. The other thing that I want to say is, again, in line with this uh, thing about accessibility of work. So everything that I have said and done over the years on this and any other topic is freely available and, and accessible from the CV link in my website. So you, you can you can just uh, you know, it's, it's all uh, it's all there, there. And there is a lot that that we have 
uh, that you know there is to say so i would encourage you to explore further now in contrast to the self understandings of the hindutva actors and the ways in which they make sense of the world what i'm going to be doing here is really talking about the ways in which the the political project of hindutva functions and the way in which it is transforming democracy and how what similarities that has globally with uh, with what is happening in other countries because uh this is happening in different degrees and to different extents in multiple democracies at this point this is not just something that is happening in india although of course uh there are there are differences but there are also a lot of very salient commonalities here so the structure of what i have to say is as follows i will i will first talk about uh four or five main broad things that i want to speak about and then go specifically to the indian case so the first thing that i want to say is that democracy and violence are not you know have a very complicated relationship because the topic of my uh, talk today is democracy under threat in india and beyond so the first thing that i want to say is that democracy and violence are often thought of as being mutually opposed that democracy is is just more and more of a good thing and it it automatically means uh more democracy means less violence that's obviously not the case if we look at many places in the world where and, and you know and, and anywhere really where often for instance elections which are seen as the festival of democracy are often marked by increased violence and high levels of structural violence that coexist alongside a democratic systems such as when people are denied uh the, their ability to access affordable housing or uh, healthcare or other rights so so democracy and violence are actually have a much more complicated relationship with with each other the second general thing that i want to and i'm only going to very briefly talk about these but the second general thing i want to say is that my my view on what is happening globally right now whether we look at uh, you know many figures ranging from trump in the us erdogan in turkey duterte in philippines bolsonaro in brazil modi in india uh, and ever more you know elections from costa rica to you, you name it like on on every continent you will find these people and these are by the way democracies um that what we see i would argue is electorally legitimated misogynist authoritarians who claim a monopoly on nationalism and therefore denounce their critics as being anti-national uh come to power claiming to challenge neoliberalism but end up benefiting from crony capitalism so this is something that is globally happening in all of these cases these are democracies but the leaders are simply electorally legitimated they win elections sure uh some way but elections as we know involve a lot more than just popular will it is about algorithms it is about finance and so on so so that sort of like the, what is happening at a global level and therefore the misogynist part is quite important here and i in my other work argued why gender is crucial to the rise of this particular version of right wing hegemonic nationalism uh gender and anti feminist views and authoritarian dispositions are very strongly correlated and uh, and and there's there's a lot that i've said about it but i just want to sort of leave that as the second thought the third thing that i want to say is that there is a parallel between so there's this this idea of othering that we know right they need an other against which the self is defined uh and and that there is also a similarity between the way in which the, the individual body and the body of the nation is seen so the body and the body politic and the the and violence in these cases in in multiple cases is actually a form of signaling so to take an example from the indian uh, situation if we think about the fact that uh there is a slogan uh ayodhya to jhaki hai mathura kashi baaki hai that I, I, what happened at ayodhya is just a glimpse of there are many other uh, other things that are to come so this idea that this is just you know this is about sending out a signal and and the symbolism is actually really important so uh, so i write a, a lot I, i i am originally from and i also write a lot about kashmir arguing for the importance of people's political and economic rights and human rights irrespective of religious divides um and that exposes one to a lot of hate so in the case of kashmir again on the first anniversary of kashmir's revocation of autonomy that was carried out overnight without any seeking any consent of the people on the first anniversary of that the the uh, you know the silver brick or the golden brick uh, i forget which was laid by the indian prime minister for this uh, the for the uh, temple at ayodhya so the the symbolism is trenchant and is meant to be very keenly observed the, these are all signals they matter uh, and in this idea that there is of transforming india into a hindu nation of course democracy is, is the casualty a uh, fourth thing that i want to say generally is that this is all legitimized and the people's consent is created in the name of this be these being projects of national pride 
whether it's make america great again or brexit or you know modi's india the idea is they're doing this in order to recover a pride for people and in that i would argue that they put together neoliberalism so neoliberalism and nationalism are often seen as opposing forces one is about capital and you know the other is about the nation actually in my work i'm arguing that neoliberalism nationalism and post colonial so i call it post colonial neoliberal nationalism work together such that you have ideas of the nation and the economy that are tied together by leaders who portray themselves as messianic saviors who are going to take the country back to a, who are going to take the country into a future which is a glorious past which is a form of a glorious past in some parts of the world that past is a pure pre-colonial past that they promise in other parts of the world they promise a a, a past which has imperial glory like they once had a future that has imperial glory so so that so these commonalities are salient now in the indian case um in the indian case uh, the uh, there are two uh, dynamics that are important one india as the world's largest democracy idea its strong contrast as opposed to systems that are seen as authoritarian a system where, which is a democracy because elections uh, and 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 then the link up with uh, especially in the post uh, you know post 9/11 era the link up with a global islamophobia a, a global idea of islamophobia on the one hand and a unch often unchallenged corporate predatory economic interests on the other and all of this ties in together so in fact the the you know when when the modi led bjp came to power in 2014 in india for the first time this uh, the, the 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 corporates and the hindutva there were there, it was duly backed it was not just just hindutva the, that was also a, an important part of the story now i've said that uh, uh, and and in my uh, congressional testimony on on kashmir for instance in october 2019 in the us i mentioned the fact that india is on a proto fascist trajectory would you believe it uh, ani a news agency actually reported on that censoring out the view, the the bit where i said proto fascist trajectory so i i'm i'm very happy to repeat it any number of times and i don't think it is careless or irresponsible i think it is fascism is not a word we should use easily but i think when we spot contexts where there is a slide towards what might eventually resemble fasc, uh, you know a, a full blown fascism then that needs to be called out and i think it's important to do that now in the case of india what has happened is and here i have to put on my glasses because the print is small and the light is good <laughs> so um so the the post 2014 transformation in india i would argue is is obviously about a clear ascendancy of hindu supremacism that you know this is this idea is deeply central the idea is that hindus have been historically subdued by muslim conquerors and western colonialists and that this is a project that's going to rescue hindus from all of those outsiders even if you know muslims have lived in india for uh, hundreds of years uh, to to say the least also the the idea that the rights of minorities even though it's formally you know even though it's a democracy the rights of minorities ought to derive from the goodwill of the majority and not from their identity as rights bearing individuals so that if muslims and other minorities behave if they behave well if they don't do anything to step out of line then of course we're not going to hurt them but the, the that is a very different idea and it's not the kind of democratic idea where a person has a right based on their individual existence Uh, so this is similar to um, this project undergoing in india the transformation is similar to a make, making india great again kind of project you know to to relate to audiences here so hindutva ideologues claim to be making india great again by making india a rising power uh, by getting india its place in the sun yet at the same time this is not empirically borne out by anything so if you look at all of the indicators of media freedom of democratic index of academic freedom india's position in all of these rankings keeps going down so the 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 truth should be you know the the facticity of this should be very easy to point out but the other thing that is also simultaneously happening is that facts don't matter when such hegemonic projects gain ground you can tell people any number of very factual things that should contradict what they believe in but their beliefs somehow manage to be resuscitated nonetheless and they'll say no that's not it you know they'll they'll find some ways of reconciling clear facts with some version of what they want to believe and that's what's happening in india increasingly in india dissent is securitized which means any kind of dissent is seen as a security threat and political labeling means that this language becomes extreme so the idea of intellectuals or people who who are critical of uh, government policies uh, or or this larger project can be labeled urban naxals which is that the idea is that they're int intellectual terrorists 
that they are urban, as in they are uh, urban educated terrorists. That's the idea or insurgents, you know, that's, that's the implication. And therefore, counterinsurgency sort of violence should be uh, legitimized at least rhetorically against them, uh, but sometimes also in, in more uh, apparent ways. Uh, and and this, is, this undermines the very idea of dissent, which is crucial to how democracies function. Uh, now, I want to give some examples here. So the reshaping of education and educational institutions is a key part of this. The appointment of university heads ever more, especially at critical universities. If you think about universities like JNU, what they've undergone in the last few years, these then have a cascading effect inside institutions in terms of syllabi, in terms of what is possible for people to be able to speak about. Um, in, in, uh, you might know of the case of Umar Khalid, a JNU student who has been in prison. So, so this, so this lack of accountability, as well as this idea that um, that you know that um, that there's no recourse to justice. So we, people still ask, where is Najib, the JNU student, uh, Muslim student who, who was the victim of, uh, you know, he disappeared. So nobody knows. So there's still that that thing that surfaces now and again online. Where is Najib? Um, this is this is a a uh, you know a, a, a situation where we find where in spite of globally being seen as a democracy, we have had. Uh, what was known as the Haridwar Hate Assembly, where open calls for genocide against Muslims and call to arms against Muslims were made by, uh, you know, people who see themselves as religious leaders. And, and this was this was in the media. They weren't afraid of saying these things. They were saying these things. It was on the media. And uh, and likewise, um, a few years ago, I remember and, and Kashmir is, of course, all of this, but much more on speed. So in the case of Kashmir, the, in the Katwa rape case, where an eight-year-old girl, Asifa, was raped and murdered, you had BJP legislators, uh, uh, two, uh, you know, two ministers who marched in a rally organized by Hindu Ekta, uh, Hindu Ekta Manch, Hindu Unity Forum, in support of the alleged rapists of this little girl. So the, the extent to which the dehumanization of those who are othered is possible today, should be cause for concern for everyone as a human being, regardless of whether they are Indian or not, Muslim or not, you know, Hindu or whatever they are. So this is this is something that is really uh, is is significant. And uh, some of the other things, and I'll uh, I'll quickly go over, uh, is the attempts to keep changing rules. They don't always succeed. On the farmers' protest, of course, the government had to had to eventually abandon that for now. Um, the, ME, the external affairs ministry last year wanted to have a rule whereby foreigners uh, speaking on certain topics would need permission if, even if they were taking part online in seminars. They had to, the pushback was there and they had to. So it's not, it's on that trajectory as I said. It's not, a, you know, India is not a Hindu nation. India's democracy is not completely undermined. But that's the direction in which this is headed if, uh, unless we do more to, for, for, to, you know, to have uh, larger numbers of people understand this. The weaponization of religious feeling and vigilante mobilization is not uh, is not new to India, but it's it's being very effectively harnessed in order to silence free speech, to stop people from literally talking about these things, um, to transform. As I said, the attack on critical thinking and education is is really at the center center of this. The extreme othering now, all sorts of people get othered. That could include the progressives, those who believe in secularism, Dalits, Christians, but Muslims are the most extreme other for the Hindutva project. And, um, and they've used a, a large number of kind of innovative strategies uh, of, of legitimizing this, that, you know, how they innovate, how they get people to, uh, so far, uh, I can't go into detail here, but how they speak to contradictory uh, constituencies of people presenting as if their interests are uniform and and they do this it's it's also like a you know a political strategy through which this is uh, legitimized uh, at its uh, base and this is something that i want to sort of i think close with at its base the idea is this question of who is a legitimate indian citizen and for hindutva even if india is a democracy the idea is yes it's a democracy but like there are Muslim nations and there are nations that are implicitly or explicitly Christians, we need to be a Hindu nation. So it's a fundamental challenge to the idea of India as a secular democracy because the idea is that India will be a Hindu nation that will confer pride on, on, uh, you know, on the nation. And that the idea of who this legitimate and worthy Indian citizen is, there, there is an, an implicit hierarchy. So the, the Hindu male upper caste person is, is the norm against which all others are measured uh, you know, implicitly as lacking in different levels to the level of worth that would enable their rights to be protected. So, uh, so, so there is that, uh, you know, as, um, 
so there is this uh, to borrow from a sociologist called Zeru Zerubavel this unmarked norm and everyone else is kind of uh, stages along that norm. The most explicit manifestation of this was the Citizenship Amendment Act, which in effect created a religious route into citizenship in uh, in India and was met with, and this is where, so I don't want it to be as if everything is hopeless, was met with a significant amount of uh, protest in India. And, 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 and this is why it's not, nothing is ever a foregone conclusion. So, uh, you know, there, there is a threat to democracy in India and globally, but it could just as well be otherwise. And that really depends on how we live our times and how much of a difference we can make through these things. Uh, as far as minorities and specifically Muslims are concerned, lynchings, beef ban lynchings, making everyday life quite difficult. And, it's, and that again is differentiated along class lines. So the poorest Muslims will have greater difficulty accessing localities in order to be able to earn their livelihood, sell vegetables or, or uh, you know, or, or um, or, or buy and rent places to live um, they will uh, or offer prayers there were recently even on the outskirts of Delhi this whole uh, you know issue around Muslims not should not be allowed to offer prayers in in parks and very often the legitimizations in many of these cases is that we're doing it it's not that it's because the area will get congested it's not that it's because the area will get insecure so there's it's always it's never explicit well it is sometimes explicitly stated but that is a there's a dual track thing happen as there are some people who state it explicitly and then that is dismissed as being fringe and for the rest of the people the idea is sold that this is in the name of a good you know for some some other more valuable reason uh, which then makes it possible for for larger numbers of i would argue even middle classes who actually go along with these views but don't want to think of themselves as bad people uh, i don't think anyone really gets up in the morning and says okay i'm a bad person how do i make the world a worse place so so the so then the really interesting thing is how is this made possible how is this made possible as a strategy and as a as a political uh, move and in this the the idea of jihad uh, various kinds of jihad is is crucial so as opposed to the declared emergency in india in the 70s what uh, what others have also said uh, is that what we are heading towards if not uh, if are not already in it is an undeclared emergency so courts have not been suspended newspapers have not been stopped from from printing what they're doing institutions have not all been shut down yet the effect that is being produced through judicial qu quietude through constitutional subversion uh, through uh, censorship and self-censorship of the media is increasingly moving along the lines towards as if they were toothless and did not have any business uh, being critical in a democracy so that's the really subversive part the fact that this is not uh, this is not explicitly happening with the army coming into the streets uh, at least not in not in india so it is happening but it's happening in this uh, in this um in this very peculiar way and and the very last thing of course would be the global validation that is derived for all this from the spectacles abroad from the diaspora mobilization from this you know the cultural link being made to to uh, indians uh, overseas and this is why the the global part uh, to to finish with what i started out is also equally important thank you really taking the threads from Professor Anand's talk um, and bringing them into this larger global context and in dialogue with India's claim as the world's largest democracy. Um, and for also... Bra no, oh, your name. Padma. 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 Thank you so much. Uh, so, I'll not try not to repeat the things that have already been said. So, I think firstly, for me, the important thing is, um, and there are two things that I want to ask you guys later. Okay. So firstly, for me, the thing is that there are um, who the so I, I, just referring to the use of language, who the we are, who the our is, is not certain. So I would not necessarily see myself as we or I, more precisely, I think I would see myself as, as being part of parallel we's. So I do not give up my, my right to speak about the US or the UK or uh, other parts of the world. And I think it, it should happen in the reverse too. Uh, equally, I think that uh, so, so that's one thing I wanted to say. The other, uh, the other point is that the idea of what is different about what hasn't happened. So there were all sorts of things that were problematic about, let's say, you know, any previous government than these particular right wing hegemons. So, you know, even including, let's say, President Obama's rule here or uh, uh, the Congress rule in India, there, there were problematic things. But I think what has happened with what does happen with these movements is their particular version of the elite, who the elite is. So the elite then becomes people who speak about human rights 
uh, becomes people who speak a certain language, like literally being able to speak a certain language. Uh, but who is not seen as the elite are huge corporate houses that are actually economically incredibly, you know, powerful and they are somehow not the elite, but being able to, uh, you know, but talking about human rights or uh, speaking in English or having gone to a certain school is somehow elite, which, which you know, is not, uh, so, so that is different. Secondly, I think the volume of violence has been turned up significantly. So it's not the same and I'm often... I'm deeply skeptical of projects of purism because I feel like that's just that's just uh, an, an impossible thing to, to be doing so that so so there is a difference and thirdly the, the attack on secularism is really direct and very central and I feel that one of the big uh, kind of thorns in the side of these this present project is is things like secularism in the constitution which was incidentally and interestingly added as an amendment in uh, much later so the, the attack on secularism is, is crucial. Now, what can be uh, done? Now, in response to that, I have a few things. So, firstly, so corporations do have this role. They do this in, in many countries, in many democracies. They're not just doing this in India. Now, what is different is the fact that we should expect a pushback from the media. We should expect greater accountability and critical reporting by the media and action on cases by the judiciary. So, I think that's one very clear point of of recognition and intervention because we we cannot you know there will be these corporates they will be doing the things that they do so the the media and judiciary i think are important uh, i think the uh, in in some sense the 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 broader idea if you ask me like how do we damage their interests to use your phrase which i quite like and i think the you know it's uh, can, can we can we anywhere i mean then that takes me to this whole question of what does the con consonance of liberal demo democratic capitalism in the post second part of the 20th century onwards what does it mean can anyone anywhere elect a government that brings the markets down i'm not sure that's that's you know that's that's with possible within the framework of that system uh, if you see you know when when the the worst outcomes sometimes including violence um, lead to uh, lead to increases and and a better performance of the stock markets and if if governments are elected that want to take housing seriously, healthcare seriously, education seriously, uh, you know, and in, in both in the West and the non-West, the markets uh, react nervously. That itself is a very interesting anthropomorphism. But my point therefore is that the disconnect between the financial systems that run our world in good or bad democracies and the political electoral systems through which representation is delivered in the name of the people that disconnect is a fundamental one and i think a systemic feature so that and un un undoing that damaging those interests i think is is a much harder project and 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 i think that therefore i would say that the main important thing is to is to is to get attention to the institutions that should be doing better the everyday uh, and and uh, challenge the everyday banalization of violence that happens and undermine the legitimization and the ignorance through which this continues to happen without more and more people being aware of it. And for that, I think that, uh, you know, so instead of, so I think even if we think of democracy in that polyarchy sense as a cons consensual government of competing elite, at least they should be competing. You know, here it is this vision that the BJP has of a Congress Mukt Bharat. We don't even want, they don't even want the opposition. So, so then the challenge is what can be done? I think one grassroots solidarity location is not just a geographical location matter the the easiest way in which they delegitimize critical voices is by saying what do you know you are not based in india and my counter is like so that industrialist who has that super big mansion who's probably never seen anyone on the street that person somehow more valid because they're just geographically at this coordinate and if somebody who's spending their life and time and energy and everything studying, experiencing, knowing that deeply and feeling the effects of that through their work is not somehow location is relevant. So I think challenging that location thing and building links with grassroots wherever we are is really important. Um, and I think secondly, the link between the sort of work that's happening to critically kind of draw attention to this and the activism so that that bridge that in now we use the term impact for it but like the academia activism bridge i think needs to be kind of uh, kept like really um, busy and constantly pedestrianized with our thoughts and um 
and i think making links with other oppressed groups so like dalits farmers you know ca protesters kashmiris other other people whose human rights so i think those solidarities of the oppressed are a very practical strategic and powerful way of drawing attention to a system that isn't just violent to you but is actually violent to a whole range of people and you know you you could be next even if you think you are insulated uh, by that privilege the uh, and and lastly i think specific campaigns as with the farmers movement and all i think taking on specific campaigns is a is a practical way in addition to that other thing that's the uh, academia activism link i think the the specific campaigns thing helps uh, so i think i've said four four ways the fifth one that i want to say is uh preserving the ability for people like us to be able to speak up for people like in this room for us to be able to continue this discourse and to not let the public sphere be shut down at least in other parts of the world and also because these projects are projects of um, right wing hegemonic nationalism are deeply insecure and very fundamentally kind of insecure in that way so it matters to them the external validation and therefore taking that validation away from them as much as possible by getting them to understand actually this is not bringing you any pride you know to the to the ordinary person that this is actually making your country slide down in all the indices this is making people fee you know actually the opposite of pride is what it's doing it's bringing shame to your country i think that just the strategic kind of use of that which is actually a fact as well would be would be a good way of uh, of taking away some of that legitimization that they build by saying the whole world loves us look we have this this is arena or stadium you know spectacle so i think that that part is equally valid to and for that the local solidarities including with grassroots in other places also need to happen because internationalism is i think where a lot of progressive forces flounder <laughs> that we have to be part of multiple kind of you know where per like plug points that have to be plugged into multiple circuits at the same time so yeah thank you I'm going to make a quick amendment to what I said earlier. If you would like to be on the live stream, just give me a thumbs up and we'll point the camera at you where you're standing. If you don't want to be on the live stream, just thumbs down and we won't turn the camera around if you're asking a question. Yeah, we do that. So, yeah. He but does it, is it okay if we get their name? Or you can give an imagined name if you More like. Is it? No. Huh? Is this too much of a hassle to go there? So okay. No, no, we could turn it yeah, around we'll if you want. No problem. Okay. So, Mohan, did you say? Mohan. Yeah. Mohit. Mohit. Okay. Yeah. So my question sort of dovetails from what Padma was asking, and my question, I think, is kind of is for both of you here, especially given both of your expertise. To put it very briefly, I would like for both of you to evaluate the possibility of the U.S. here kind of supporting and putting up. and implicitly endorsing an authoritarian regime in india given its larger interests and as i see it right now there are two primary interests that it has one india has a huge market for financial capital and no no government would want to lose access to such a huge market and there are clear interests why you know the us and also western democracies would not want to lose access to india this is reason number 1 so reason number 2 i see is you know india as a buffer against china so in this light i really i mean especially given both of you are kind of working in international relations i really would want the both of you to evaluate you know what is the possibility of us heading in that future in that timeline in that universe where you know just like pinochet just like suharto you had like a established authoritarian regime which had implicit support from the us which is basically you know in its broader geopolitical interest and i'm asking this question because you know i think you know you are talking about a pushback and you know right now i'm not seeing internal pushback coming from any institutions as such but there is some you know questioning happening globally for instance you know there was a uh the un wanted to wanted to be an amicus curiae on the ca act you know that was very surprising and so there are some you know small signs of pushback globally but 
overall, there is an increasing possibility that you know international organizations and the US might just neglect these small so-called human rights violations and implicitly just endorse this authoritarian regime. So I want kind of both of your I I, I understand your question somewhat differently and um, uh, so I, I see your thing as, as so you're saying that can they uh, will the US or will the US be comfortable propping up authoritarian rule that's how I'm reading this question so um, so I think that uh, firstly there is some reason for hope I think that uh, while you know in the, the last US elections I think the fact that it is a, a different administration here and as I said you know all sorts of problems with those who are not right-wing authoritarians of this of this kind but nonetheless I think that it matters that it's not Trump uh, and because as, as you knew from the Trump Modi connection that you know not just a personal one but the level at which that spectacle played a role in creating validation so I think that's a thank God for small mercies moment that you know that it is at least not the Trumpists in power here uh, even if again that we may have just kicked the can down the road that that also is is a, is a parallel sense would they do that now I think again there's no foregone conclusions here but I think the liberal international order uh, as you know as as we see it has has always had its uh, hypocrisies and its selectivities but I don't think that it is that easy for uh, you know, for even an, a very kind of uh, a government like the one in India right now to very easily deliver everything on a platter that is required in terms of uh, corporate, transnational corporate interests. And the failure of the farmers' protests is a clear example of that. So I feel that in that context, and this is where, uh, so apart from the imag imagining economics, otherwise the post-colonial neoliberalism, nationalism, neoliberal nationalism work of mine might be of interest to you specifically also since you have the connection with economics, that the, the thing is that there, it is a very complex society. It is in India. It's not all aligned in a sense that it is not all been, com you know, completely kind of aligned structurally in terms of interests. So there are all sorts of contradictions and paradoxes that that system can throw up. If you look at the co connection of the rural urban, the nature of the middle class, the nature of the manufacturing base, the, the sorts of things, the, the questions of pollution, the question of land, the uh, question of kind of uh, specific values that play a role in regional context, the diversity of the regions. So I think given that whole spectrum it isn't that easy for them to reconcile all the con contradictions to materially deliver the results that the transnational interests would want it is much easier for them which as I have argued in my other work on the rise of the right it is much easier for them to rhetorically and in political strategy terms project the idea that they've reconciled those contradictions and win elections in India through that the actual material delivery of the results of that I don't think is as easy. So I think that that's again a small mercies moment that it's therefore not that easy for them to, to give what, what the interests internationally would require. I think also there is again some cause for hope in the fact that uh, and this is not uh, sorry on say things like Xinjiang in, in, in the US right now there is a whole geopolitical history of communist kind of you know other Soviet Union other that's playing a role in all sorts of ways etc broadly but nonetheless the fact that for other instrumentalist reasons even like I'll grant even that cynicism if Xinjiang matters for the US and if the idea is that if they if it is possible for people to see ever more how Situations like Kashmir, for instance, and I've argued this in, in India is to Kashmir as China is to Xinjiang, that there is a circulation of strategies of repression and technologies of repression in, in these contexts between explicitly authoritarian systems and more democratic systems, ostensibly democratic systems, or even to some extent, actually democratic systems. So if that is the case, then I think the, I think in the US too, I don't think administrations anywhere officials you know people that there is a there is a plurality and I don't think people don't see the ways in which India and China are increasingly converging in terms of the exercise of political power so that again for me would be a moment of hope that there is some recognition that much as people would like there to be a starker more stark difference between communists and th th those who are part of our quad but actually that's in reality, it's, it's far from certain that I think people are able to see that there are similarities. So that's again, one way in which internationally that, that story isn't holding up very well. I think lastly, the idea that uh, the rankings are falling constantly, 
various rankings including those issued by important international kind of uh, prominent at least international organizations including those based in the us matters because the fact that these rankings are are going down matters it it matters even if it doesn't matter there it it matters in some sense to people's understanding the uh, the uh, the the fact that and lastly the idea of national interest so obviously you know the a state the i'm saying obviously but i want to say this for a reason so states will obviously act in line with their national interests now i would say that the national i would go with those who combine a a, a more kind of while being mindful of the realist aspect of it um who also combine that and here the person that so uh, you know so for instance here the person i would mention is yuta welders the the constructivist scholar whose paper on constructing national interests so the idea that even things like national interests aren't just things that are there available they are constructed by the very people who claim to be representing them in other words therefore that any country's foreign policy is of course determined by the idea that this department thinks this that ministry thinks that but at the same time those interests are not immune to domestic pressures are not immune to what people think what the newspapers say what the general feeling what the think tanks want to be putting out reports on and that constructivist work in progress constantly changing aspect is where i see my role as a as a as a public intellectual and as an academic to be saying these things because that matters the more people get to see those things the more the less certain it is if you if you if you were ever a nerd i should say if heisenberg uncertainty you cannot determine the position and momentum at the same time right so so this whole thing is actually circular so what we do again going back to that point what we do what you do matters it it can matter at least it can also not matter but that's the world we live in and and so absurd as it is i would actually on your question on this question i think that the structural linkages you know the the ability to deliver the role of image and reputation globally if not reputation at least an image uh the the domestic sources of influence on foreign policy i think all of that matters so i don't think this is all lost i think there's there's everything to be arguing for all the time ever more including with with those you know mac, ma, at micro macro meso levels with our friends and with the people we work with and with our fellow academics or fellow activists or you know any anyway. thank you so that's a a a very big question and i uh, thank you for me it came from your point about islamophobia and then refer to your question about caste so on is i'm a big fan of of discourse matters and dialogue matters but i think also encountering words on the written page also matters so 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 i will also refer to two texts that exists now on islamophobia what i've argued is that islamophobia is of course increasing and it's multidimensional in india and i say that there are four different registers in which we can see it one the the idea that indian muslims are seen as suspect citizens that you know they have to always prove their citizenship one way or the other uh kashmiri muslims are seen as latent terrorists that you know they are just problematic at any point just because of the fact that they are muslims they must be terror- they might be terrorists uh pakistan is seen as an existential other like as a state this kind of uh, you know other state the the thing that india is not in in a very there are so there are rivals and there are enemies it's not just a rival it's an it's seen as an enemy other and fourthly uh, that uh, the muslim refugees such as the rohingya for instance are seen as invasive pests along the lines of very violent biological metaphors that we also know from other parts of the world that these are in fact the indian home minister uh, said this oh, that you know they are they are like vermin or something that you know they are they are pests so the so that so i've written about this in much more detail in something called islamophobia in india in society in space also available online now with the question of caste I want to say two things about it like I want to respond in two parallel ways one I think that you are absolutely right in that uh, there is an intersectionality to how this works and that it's very hard to to fathom and that it's also you know it has the dual problems of when making arguments in the public domain on the one hand of authentic claims and on the other and and it will um, is that connected now I think it is yeah Yeah, okay so on the one hand there is the the way in which the 
the politics of identity and, and even sometimes the scavenging of that that is enabled so for instance if we say that just a person's embodiment or their birth identity is what makes them right in a certain context no matter what then you can have some very regressive very right wing very anti minority figures that are taken up by the right wing and so so there's that problem on the other hand you also have the the so there's that problem and on the other hand you have the problem of okay how do we how do we link that to experience? So one thing that immediately came to mind, I don't know if you read fiction, but I'm a firm believer in the fact that political issues, apart from newspapers and academic articles, fiction is, a, is, a, is one way in which we hear those stories. So there is a, a novel and I've just looked up the name as well because I do book posts and that's one thing I think Facebook is good for. It's good for an archive you can reach out at any point, which is why I put everything there. So this is a novel called The Hindu. And uh, it's a novel and it's by a, a Dalit author called Sharan Kumar Limbale. It was published in 2003 and it's an important text of Dalit literature and an indictment of the ghastly violence of caste against the background of backdrop of ascendant Hindutva in India. So I say that I found in it a delineation of complexities of gender, caste, democracy, violence and power as lived in the local world of a village. So I would say to reading literatures that reference that because that would bring attention to the intersectionality of all of this. The other thing, the other kind of now switching paragraphs, and so I, I believe that literature has a really important role. Like what I've said on Kashmir in my academic work and what I say on Kashmir in future tense, I would not necessarily put that in a hierarchy. I would just say there are different ways of saying things that are able to appeal to different languages of thought. The other thing that I want to say on caste is basically that we can look at caste as a, as a fact of electoral arithmetic. And you see this in India all the time, any elections. There's there's literally no other way in which it's referenced except that this category of, of this particular caste in this region had this percent vote. How would that party get more percent votes of something? So it's just seen as something that is relevant in an electoral arithmetic and as just that fact, empirical thing. That's one clear way in which it gets seen. Secondly, I think there is caste as lived experience. And there, I think this, again, this idea of narrative, experience narrative is really important. And, uh, and that there it is, uh, it's, there, are, there are then there are bridges and, and translations of identity that need to happen, uh, uh, always already incomplete. Thirdly, I think there is caste as social structure and how it is in, in functions in intersectional specific contexts. And, uh, and, and that is the thing that we access through political movements and, you know, and specific political movements and how they either do or do not al ally with caste struggles. Um, fourthly and lastly, I think there's, um, there's the, the idea of caste, I would say, as, a dis as sort of like a diversion in the way it which, in which it is used as a diversion. And why do I say diversion? Because so, for instance, you would have this way in which Hindutva... Uh, ideologues will often try to manufacture a Hindu identity, construct it by, by making la people feel, and that includes, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in caste terms, reaching out to make everyone feel like all of the, you, yes, you may be these other identities, but the keeps trying to reconnect is, is that of being a Hindu. So that's a creation of the Hindu fold out of people who might not have seen their most important identity to be Hindu. They might have seen their most important identity in other terms. So that is, so that's one thing for con um, constructing Hindu identity. And second, 4A and then 4B is this, is this point about caste is diversion is also how, and I think this is maybe truer in the diaspora, is how caste sometimes is used as a sub, a fuge by a certain uh, strain of activism that does not want to confront other issues which might be more explicitly seditious or anti-national uh, even if they are kind of you know so for instance and I'm speaking from ex experience not, uh, you know of, of a uh, different country and context but this idea that we can talk about caste but we are definitely not saying anything about Kashmir that kind of thing and that's, you know, that's partly a safety distance move, but it's also a very interesting and politically relevant thing to observe that why, why do you think that these two, one can be talked about and the other not? Yes, the nature of oppression is not the same, but certainly there's human rights denial and certainly there's the very kind of obvious legal fact of a political, you know, dispute, which is all there in anyone, should anyone care to look beyond Indian TV. So there's also that use of caste. And I would say that that in all of these registers, caste is as a, a fact of electoral arithmetic, caste is lived experience, caste is an intersectional social structure, and caste is as a, as a, as a distraction in these ways. I think for, so it's, it functions in multiple ways. And there isn't beyond this, I think, I don't think there is a, a good answer that one can give that would substitute for actually engaging with, with work.
So there's, there's that I, I want to leave you with. And I think that uh, many people, I, uh, you know, people here in this room might already know, but uh, Rohit Vemila, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Dalit student from Hyderabad Central University who uh, committed suicide, but it was much more than that because there were a whole ways, structural ways in which he was marginalized and in which not, and that was a structural thing. Like, you know, his, his journey and the, the tragic end of his life is not just again a sto a sto uh, one person. It it ref it's reflective and symbolic. So in the letter, in the letter that he left in his uh, last note, where he writes, uh, which is also available online on Facebook and places, you can you can read it. I think that letter is such an important and interesting text because he says not just the fact that he loves the stars and the trees and that you see that there's this very real human person that you know that like each of us deserve to live and deserve to not face those injustices. But he also says at one point he refers and this is before the last election in the US. So Trump hadn't, obviously Trump was still in power. So he refers to, to Trump and he refers to that. And I feel like I don't think anybody's ever commented upon that. But I think that that is really important that the oppressed anywhere are able to see the, you know, when if we really start, start from those points, we should and we are often able to see these intersectional things. The fact that uh, Rohit Vemila refers to Trump and to what is happening to the world in that Trump. I mean, th these are, I mean, essentially at the end of the day, we've made lines uh, upon landmass. That doesn't mean that the political social forces that are actually governing uh, bodies and, uh, and you know, and, and, and that re the regions of the world are somehow stopping at those lines. So we have to look beyond the, these nationalist frameworks, and and uh, you know, and and I think that that's that's really important. So so it's it's caste, but it's also intersectional, and it's also tied to all, all other. I mean, one of the ways in which I think caste is actually like a historically resilient form of indigenous racism in India. You know, that's that's not not exactly the same. No two oppressions are, but I think that we have to think oppressions, bracketing them together across what we might naturally think of as being relevant uh, or, or in the same frame. Just one. We will, uh, we will um, we've got to call to answer, uh, sorry, to ask your question and then close out. Thank you so much. Right. It's just something that I wanted to ask you and, and, you know, whoever, whichever person in this room wants to reflect, but I want to know. So how does one have you, this is because I, I increasingly encounter a large number of people who have the same problem. Do you also from your own contexts have difficulties increasingly communicating with those you would have previously thought of as friends and family? Because I feel like a lot of young people especially come up to me and say like, it's really hard to communicate with my family, but also how do I get across? So if there are ways in which, practical ways in which you found really useful, just as a group think wisdom kind of a thing, then maybe I want to know what those are, I, either here or later. So so that's one thing I want to, because the, I think that's really kind of the relationality, the, the way in which it's uh, intersecting uh, familial kinship relationality. And secondly, I think the, uh, you know, how, what do you think from based on your experience how do you think the terms of solidarities can be improved like are there are there things that you want to say because i want to hear them so can i so i um i went to a medical college in india a government medical college when i was after high if, school when I was 17. Okay, sorry uh, to interrupt, but if you want to stand, you can, but also, okay. I, I'm sitting on four cushions, so I feel you. <laughs> so, um, so uh, I went to a medical college in India, which is a government medical college, um, many years ago after high school. So I'm in a WhatsApp group with about, I don't know, 100 people. And it's just heartbreaking to see some of my old classmates become such proponents of Hindutva, and I can... Uh, I can tell you that the vast majority are uh, uh, Brahmins, okay? Um, so I, like, you, both of you spoke about the intersectionality, so that's very interesting to me. And also coming from Hyderabad, you know, we grew up sort of celebrating each other's festivals, whether it was Ramzan or whether it was Diwali, etc., etc. So I, I come from that, in a sense, I don't want to romanticize, but that, that's the culture that I grew up in. So it's very, um, so my friends call me the director of Hate Watch. There is some uh, human aspects in everybody. So I try to like focus on that aspects. If people are suffering because of anything, because of any party, any politician, how the people suffer, what they are going through, and if a person is lynched, how his family has been affected, highlighting those things 
we'll at least try to duck some hearts. And people who are not intrinsically very wicked, uh, you know, maybe they're affected and they, they kind of take that to heart. You know, so that's what you know the, uh, that um, there are there is obviously never a hundred percent agreement that we can arrive at with individuals but i think it's whether we can find the common ground so even as i you know even if we are colleagues even if i hear the speak sometimes i'm like no i don't agree with that part or i don't agree with all of that part so uh, because i think that there can be good or bad academics activists uh, institutions elite or non elite so that part i'm i, I hope um, you know have a different view on but in the but the, but i think the important thing is whether we are all you know whether we are all fundamentally committed to the idea that other people are real that their reality and their oppression matters and that we're willing to do something about it i think that's that's the really important thing so uh, so the reason i asked you that question about how you deal with other people and who who you disagree with but may feel close to on on political matters even if you um disagree politically but are close to them and also the terms of solidarity is because i think i really really want to understand and from as many people in as many contexts as possible the solidarities how they are formed and because that's that's a Uh, because you know because you can you can you can be very erudite in a very specialized rarefied field of some kind of science but not not have the the humanities exposure it doesn't have to be the case but i think that's why education attack happen as you know i think the other thing that always strikes me is is how sometimes you would have the coexistence a, a lot of the times people who have very uh, kind of you know violent views about others correspond with and exist in the same individual who's otherwise a very nice person to you you know they'll they'll be like really nice people and you're struck by how can this person who's so helpful and so nice and so kind also be the person who votes for all of this or thinks that this doesn't matter or watches this tv channel and i think that's that's the really kind of you know striking and 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 that gets to that question of solidarity for me so i would say there's ignorance and indifference on the one hand and then there's malice and then there's structural creation and perpetuation of malice and that structural part is where i think the interventions can need also the academic work the other thing that i was thinking about when you said you know people who say that they'll think about, we also have to think about do do self do people fool themselves to what extent do they fool themselves or fool others like you know if if somebody says to you i'll really think about it or i've changed my view do they really or are they just being strategic about it so i think that that is also another thing how how do we actually get real change to happen and how do we also avoid the the turkey pardon scenarios you know people will very often like you spend a lot of time and energy getting someone to understand an injustice and they'll be like okay maybe these three people of this identity that i'm interacting with are not bad but everyone else is still the same so it's also like moving beyond i don't have answers but i'm just throwing these questions out into you and into ether online like how do we move beyond that scenario they'll be like maybe these people are okay the ones who are here are okay but the rest of them are generally as that identity that's that's a problem i think do reciprocity work if we see common ground can we get them how do we get them to see common ground and then the idea that you know if it was either by using facts or by using emotions if uh, is does it really work i i would like also like more proper kind of answers to this more work on this because if like how do we counter the systematic indoctrination by political parties i think everyone in this room knows but the role of it cells the role of whatsapp in forwarding specific messages and creating that common sense that you were just referring to the wish so so in that i mean i think that how do we how do we challenge that with the with the resource uh, asymmetry that's clearly um, why do more americans not know about what's happening in india or indeed in any other part of the world and that's not just americans and europeans and you know i think this is like one of the fundamental things about the the racialized hierarchy of nation states and the systematic structures of knowledge 
is that no one in the global south, as I gave you the example of Rohit Vemula, can even afford to be unaware of the injustices that, are, because it is so palpable and real, the effects will strike the global south, countries in the global south. But it's just so much more possible for people not even to know about the fact that there is such a thing as the RSS or that there is such a thing as Hindutva. And I feel like that's also one of our challenges, uh, whoever we are, in, in getting more people to understand these interconnections. I think that really matters. I think that the other, um, these projects are hegemonic because they're hegemonic. They're not just domination projects. Even people who are hurt by these projects subscribe to them. Essentially, the, the classical definition of hegemony. Um, the witnessing and the acknowledging is really hard to happen. I see that so much with the Kashmiri Pandit, Kashmiri Muslim divide. Simply just witnessing and acknowledging his historical pains, injustices, traumas. And it's nearly impossible for states. So I don't, I don't know, but I think that's something we have to keep thinking about. Storytelling is really important. As I was saying earlier, the power of narratives. I think if anything can break through this uh, ever in any context, large or small, it's the storytelling. So, uh, so yeah, um, and, and also your comments, like really interesting. I think that whole uh, thing that you were saying about how the space of liberation that works beyond just one's own is seen as such a privileged space and such a white middle class space. And I don't think it has to be. I don't think it has even been that because there are all sorts of liberation struggles that have been led by different identities but they've just that i think that's a that the normative construction that we need to keep challenging while at the same time not a prioritizing this is who can talk about this i feel like that's really problematic because anybody should be able to talk about injustices as long as they've made effort to understand what they're talking about and are open to changing their point of view so um so i think yeah thank you so much for you know for this i think this was really Yawning also been a really interesting thing, not just speaking to you, but also hearing you say things because that's that's really important. So really important for us. Thank you. Thank you.